So hi, everyone. Um, this is a very unique um, opportunity to give our first uh, science seminar online. So although we are all in the cloud today, um, I work at the Royal Botanic Garden Sydney, and this is the main uh, place where we usually run the seminars. So I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, we have been running the seminar series for um, more than two years now. We usually do this at the Calix, uh, the Royal Botanic Garden in Sydney. Uh, but because of the current pandemic crisis, we have decided to move the seminar series online. And so we are really thankful for Professor Simon Ho to agree to be basically our guinea pig and be the first one to try uh, giving a seminar online. Uh, so Simon not only agreed to do this, but he's also using his own Zoom account for this particular seminar. So we don't have a time limit on this. Um, so there will be more um, online seminars in the future, we hope. Uh, this is a success, so stay tuned and I'll keep advertising them um, after the seminar. We will be taking questions uh, at the end of this, um, at the end of the seminar. And the way we will do this is I will ask people perhaps to uh, raise their hands in the chat. Um, and so then I can take questions from the various people in, uh, in a logical order. So don't use the chat to ask your questions because it's possible that Simon will not see it while he uh, tries and, and answer the question. But uh, if you just put your name and then I can hand over uh, everyone asking questions. Uh, all right, so enough for the general introduction. Just, just from a technical point of view, I hope everyone is okay. Uh, most people have used Zoom before, so that's great. Uh, I just want to say if there's any issue uh, with security, if we have any problem, which uh, hopefully won't happen, we will just uh, stop the seminar immediately. So everything will uh, close and we'll just reopen in another room. And so I'll send an email uh, with the link, the same email that I, I sent. Uh, earlier to announce the seminar. All right, so um, now without uh, waiting too long, I'd like to introduce Professor Simon Ho, uh, who is a professor at the University of Sydney. And um, I won't introduce you longer, Simon. Uh, uh, many people know you already. Simon is a, is a great uh, colleague and a co-worker. Uh, we have uh, had several projects with Simon and the Royal Botanic Garden in the past. And so here's a great opportunity to hear about uh, your general research. So thanks, Simon. Up to you. Thanks, Herve, for hosting this seminar and for the introduction. Um, my talk is entitled uh, Phylogenomics in the Time Tree of Life, but I'll actually be mostly talking about the evolution of angiosperms, flowering plants, um, which are one of the study systems that I've been interested in in the past few years, uh, alongside my work on marsupials and birds. And in the first half of my talk, I'll be giving some methodological background and in the second half, I'll focus on our recent work on angiosperm evolution. <clears throat> so the evolution of, of life on Earth, uh, a lot of what we know about it is based on the fossil record. And the fossil evidence shows that life began billions of years ago, that uh, plants colonised land hundreds of millions of years ago. And flowering plants emerged in the Cretaceous uh, at a time when the terrestrial environments were dominated by dinosaurs and other reptiles. And more recently, we see the um, diversification of modern groups of mammals and birds. But the fossil record is, is largely silent about some groups of organisms, such as um, microbes, like uh, bacteria and viruses, which have left um, phys physical traces in the, in the fossil record. Um, some bacteria have left chemical traces. Uh, also, um, larger organisms, such as uh, flatworms and um, other soft-bodied organisms that have left very patchy fossil records. Some of these groups are almost invisible in the fossil record. <clears throat> but even large organisms with some hard body parts, um, such as some groups of birds, have very patchy fossil records, and some of them um, have almost no fossil records at all. And as we go deeper back in time, the fossil record becomes patchier just because uh, fossils are destroyed by geological processes over time. But fortunately, we can reconstruct um, some of the evolutionary history of life on Earth and the timescale of that evolution um, by analysing the genomes of present-day organisms. And this is because the evolutionary process has left signatures of evolution, uh, including the time frame of evolution, in the genomes. 
And the way we reconstruct time scales from these genomes is using a tool known as the molecular clock. So in principle, the molecular clock is fairly simple, um, as illustrated by this very simple example here. So say we have DNA sequences from four primates, human, chimp, gorilla, and macaque, and we have some idea about their evolutionary relationships, uh, either based on morphological data or from genetic evidence. And we might have some idea about when humans and chimps last had a common ancestor. So based on this fossil, Sahelanthropus, we believe that humans and chimpanzees diverged about six and a half million years ago. Uh, this fossil is quite close to the ancestor of these two lineages. And with this information, uh, we can um, estimate the evolutionary rate or substitution rate along these blue branches in the tree. And that's because we know the genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees, either at a gene or at the whole genome level. And we know the time frame over which that change occurred. So we can divide the amount of genetic change by the time frame of that genetic change to obtain the evolutionary rate. And if we assume that the rate has been constant throughout the tree, throughout the primate tree, then we can infer the dates of these other divergences. <clears throat> we can then uh, rescale the tree, draw the tree to a time scale. And so now what we have is a chronogram or a time tree. But in this process known as molecular dating or molecular clock dating, there are several important sources of uncertainty. <clears throat> First, the evolutionary relationships might not be well known. And this is because they have to be estimated from morphological or genetic data. There might be some uncertainty in the fossil evidence used to uh, what's called calibrate the molecular clock. So this is where we use fossil evidence to constrain the age of one or more divergence events in the tree. There might be uncertainty about where that fossil attaches to the tree or also some uncertainty in the age of the fossil itself. And there might be some uncertainty in the pattern of rate variation among lineages. So in this example, we assume that the rate has remained constant throughout the primate tree, but we know that this is rarely the case in reality. So a range of different data types have been used for molecular dating over the years. The first studies were in the 1960s. Um, the first study in 1962 used amino acid sequences. And since then, researchers have been fairly innovative in terms of the data types used for molecular dating. Uh, some, such as uh, microsatellites, evolve very quickly and are best used for studying very recent uh, events. Whereas others like protein folds evolve over hundreds of millions of years and are best used for studying deep events in the uh, tree of life. But as, as you might expect, the by far the most widely used form of data for molecular dating is uh, nucleotide sequences. And with advances in sequencing technology and genome projects, we are seeing an explosion in nucleotide sequence data for molecular dating. And this has um, a lot of potential for uh, understanding the evolutionary process, but also brings big um, daunting challenges for, in terms of the analyzing large data sets and um, bringing the complexity of the evolutionary process. So in the, in the context of molecular dating, um, it's useful to consider different forms of rate variation that are present in our data set. So one form of rate variation is that across loci or gene effects. Um, in other words, um, this is another way of saying that, that different genes evolve at different rates. So one example of this is um, in animal cells where mitochondrial genes tend to evolve much more quickly than nuclear genes. And in plants, we see different rates between uh, mitochondrial, chloroplast, and nuclear genomes. But this form of rate variation is relatively easy to take into account because we can allow a different rate for each gene or, or each of the um, gene trees. And so this is a fairly simple model because when you need one parameter for each of the genes. Another widespread form of rate variation is that across lineages or known as lineage effects. And this is where different lineages or different species um, have different evolutionary rates. And there's evidence that this is widespread across the tree of life and uh, including in plants. So in a tw 2013 study, we looked at um, evolutionary rates in flowering plants and each of these data points represents uh, a comparison between a pair of uh, angiosperm families. And so the y-axis shows the difference in substitution rate between the two members of that pair. And the x-axis shows the difference in plant height. And the plant height is measured as the, as the average maximum height across species in each of the families. And what we find in both of these plots 
um, is that we have a negative relationship for chloroplast genes and for nuclear genes. And what this indicates is that um, taller plants tend to evolve more slowly. And we believe that this is because the rate of genome copying is slower in taller plants. So this form of rate variation, rate variation across lineages or across species, uh, has been well known for, for a long time. And there are models that can deal with this, known as relaxed clock models. So in these models, each branch of the tree can have a different rate. So we have a rate parameter for every branch in the tree. So it's a fairly complex model. But there's been a lot of development in this area. A more complex uh, pattern of rate variation can arise when we have different um, among lineage rate variation in different genes. So in this really simple example, in gene one, the chimpanzee lineage has been evolving more quickly, quickly than the human lineage, whereas the reverse pattern has occurred in gene two. And what this means is that we need a, a single model of rate variation cannot be used to apply to both genes. We need one model of rate variation for gene one and a different model of rate variation for gene two. So this increases the complexity of the model. And these are known, by, known as gene by lineage interactions or residual effects. We developed a tool to uh, assist researchers in, in working out how many clock models are needed for their data set and how to assign these clock models to the genes in the data set. This was published in 2014. Uh, earlier this year, we published a study in molecular biology and evolution uh, where we looked at different models of rate variation and we studied, um, we, we examined the, the fit of these different models in a range of data sets, including 30 multi locus data sets and genome scale data sets from marsupials and birds. And what we found that gene effects and lineage effects were the dominant forms of rate variation uh, in these genomic data sets. Um, so we found that models that accounted for gene effects and lineage effects provided um, were, the, were the most highly supported among the genes that we compared, uh, among the models that we compared, whereas models that took residual effects into account um, were less favored and po possibly because they were um, involved a large number of parameters were much more complex. So this result is reassuring because it means that we can, we can use relatively simple models to capture the most important forms of, <clears throat> of rate variation in genomic data sets. So now um, for the second part of my talk, I'm gonna describe some of the work that we've done on the evolution of flowering plants. So this plot shows the number of species known from the fossil record uh, of plants. And this plot is perhaps a bit out of date, but what we can see here is that in the, in the deep past, the plant diversity was dominated by uh, ferns and their relatives and by conifers and their allies. And in the Cretaceous, we see the appearance and diversification of angiosperms or flowering plants. So, uh, and, and they've come to dominate the diversity of plants um, in the present day. So the origin and diversification of angiosperms has been a key uh, system of interest to researchers doing molecular dating. And this has led to a long-standing debate over the timing of the origin of angiosperms with um, molecular estimates generally favoring a much deeper time scale for the origin of angiosperms. So I'm gonna be using this, this plot for the next few slides. And on this plot, the x-axis shows the estimated age of crown angiosperms, and the y-axis shows the number of angiosperm taxa in the data set that's being analyzed. So the first estimate here is by Bill Martin and colleagues in 1989. Um, in this, so the size of the circle is proportional to the, the number of genes in the data set, as shown by this key here. So this data set, uh, this uh, study, oops, this study analyzed two genes. And what uh, Martin and colleagues found was that the age of crown angiosperms, so crown angiosperms are the most recent common ancestor, the age of crown angiosperms is the most recent common ancestor of all of the present day angiosperms, or it can also be interpreted as the first divergence within angiosperms. And uh, they estimated this, uh, the age of crown angiosperms in the Carboniferous, so about 320 million years ago. So that's considerably earlier than the earliest fossil record of angiosperms. As we go into the 90s, 1990s, we see um, larger data sets in terms of number of genes and um, still with relatively small numbers of taxa in the data set, but we see that the estimates are now in the Triassic to Jurassic. 
In the 2000s, we see an expansion of, of data sets to include more taxa, and the estimates are still in the Triassic to Jurassic uh, time range, except for this estimate over here in the Carboniferous. And as we move into the 2010s, we see a continued increase in the size of data sets, with some uh, comprising sequences from hundreds of taxa, and also from whole chloroplast genomes, like this study here by, um, that we published in 2017. So what we generally see is that, that among all of these molecular estimates, most of them fall in the Triassic to Jurassic for the age of crown angiosperms, um, which is well before the, the Cretaceous origin of the fossils. So I'm gonna focus on the results of our study from 2017. And this is work led by my former PhD student, Charles Foster and was done in collaboration with, uh, with, with people at the Botanic Gardens in Sydney. So in this study, we estimated the age of crown angiosperms at about 220 million years in the Triassic. And this was done using an analysis of uh, whole chloroplast genomes from about 200 taxa. And this tree only shows representatives of the orders that were included in our data set. So in this, uh, in this tree, we see some of the key relationships among uh, angiosperm lineages we see the um, ANA grade angiosperms, so Amborella here as the sister lineage to other angiosperms. Then this next sister lineage is Nymphiales, which is the water lilies and, their, and other aquatic plants. And then Ostrobaleales. And then we have the Magnolids as a sister, to the, uh, sister group to the rest of the um, core angiosperms. So in this study, not only did we estimate the, the time scale as shown in this tree, but we also tested how sensitive our results were to different models, different methods, and to changes in the data set as well. So to, to illustrate the work that we did, I'm gonna focus on the ages of these two nodes here. So this is the, uh, this is the age of crown angiosperms, and this is the age of uh, crown eudicots. So when we made changes to the model of diversification, so, so the, this, these analyses were done using a, a Bayesian approach. Um, and for those of you familiar with the Bayesian phylogenetic approach, uh, you'll recognize this as the tree prior. So as part of this approach, we, spent, we use a, a model of speciation to describe the, the tree that led to the, um, to the present day taxa. And in this model, we can allow different levels of extinction and also incomplete sampling of, of, the, of the present day taxa. So when we vary the level of extinction and vary the level of, of sampling of modern day taxa, we don't actually see much impact on the data estimates for, um, for crown eudicots and for uh, crown angiosperms. So it seems that our estimates are robust to changes in the tree prior. We also varied aspects of the clock model. So the model of rate variation among lineages. Um, from top to bottom, we have uh, an uh, we allow greater variation among lineages in terms of rate. We allow a lower or a higher rate. Uh, we get a different estimate when we use a different model, uh, method called penalized likelihood. So we get a different estimate for the crown, uh, age of crown eudicots and for crown angiosperms. And we also see some variation when we use different clock models. So here we assume that uh, the strict clock, which, um, which means that the rate is constant throughout the tree. And for these two different relaxed clocks as well, we see slight differences in the estimates. But Overall, uh, regardless of the changes to the clock model or to the method, dating method, we see that most of the estimates, um, at least for crown angiosperms, are in the Triassic. And one interesting result that we obtained in the study was uh, when we looked at um, different, when we, when we tried changing the data set. So the full data set includes about 80 genes. So they're all the protein coding genes in the chloroplast genome. And then we tried subsampling these the, the data set to produce smaller data sets. So this estimate was produced by analyzing only three genes out of the 80 or so. And what we see is that um, regardless of the size of the data set, the estimates are fairly similar. And as we increase the size of the data set, there's not much improvement in the estimates. So um, what we would normally expect is that as we add more data, our estimates get more precise. We have less uncertainty because we have more information in the data set, but this does not seem to be the case here. So these are the results from a more recent study that we did. Uh, we published this earlier this year in Systematic Biology. 
And this is also an analysis of, of chloroplast genomes, but there aren't very many taxa in this tree because it's actually part of a larger analysis of green plants. So you might not be able to see the details of this tree on your screen, but the tree shown here is actually just the, this part of the red box. That's the angiosperms there, but we have green plants here and also uh, red algae as the art group here. So these are, this is about a hundred chloroplast genomes. And uh, interestingly, we find a similar age for crown angiosperms in the Trias to Jurassic. The uncertainty is quite wide because this actually takes into account a range of estimates that we obtained under a variety of conditions with different clock models and, and different priors. Um, but it's interesting to see that the, that the age of crown angiosperms is still fairly similar to the previous studies, uh, despite the fact that we included a range of green plant taxa and the fossil calibrations, uh, more than 30 age constraints were from throughout the, the green plants and not just from the angiosperms. So in this study, we also examined the effect of uh, using different numbers of clock models, so different models of rate variation among lineages. So this plot's a little bit hard to follow, but each of these data points is a node time in the tree. So each of these, each of these data points represents the age estimate of one of these nodes. And the x-axis shows the mean age estimate, whereas the y-axis shows the, the amount of uncertainty in the estimate or the width of the uncertainty. So um, the, each data point represents the age of the node plus the width of this uncertainty bar on the y-axis. <clears throat> And uh, what we find when we have one model of rate variation across the whole data set is that there's a lot of uncertainty in our estimates. So if we estimate a node that's 1 billion years old, then there's about 500 million years of uncertainty in that estimate. But if we start using larger numbers of clock models, so for example, here we have one clock model for first kernel positions and one clock model for second kernel positions. And um, those of you familiar with molecular evolution will will appreciate that this sort of partitioning will capture the dominant form of rate variation in these data sets. Um, we find that the uncertainties decreased. So for a node with a, an age of a billion years, the, uh, the uncertainty is now only about 400 million years. And if we now use nine clock models, so this is where we, we group the genes into nine, nine different groups uh, based on the degree of rate variation among lineages, we find that the uncertainty is reduced further. So for a, a billion year old node in the tree, the, er, the uncertainty is about 200 million years. And as we increase the number of clock models, so if we, if we assign one clock model to every single gene in the data set, uh, this doesn't improve by much more. And we also risk, uh, run the risk of over parameterization if we do that. So what this suggests is that um, when we increase the amount of data, we don't improve the precision of our estimates very much, but by increasing the number of clock models to capture different patterns of rate variation, we do increase our, our estimates, they improve our estimates. So I'm just going to finish with this example from uh, nuclear genomic analysis. So the, the last two examples that I presented were analyses of chloroplast genomes, but now this is a, a dating study of nuclear genes. And the focus, so this is published earlier this year, the focus of this study was actually on the genome of the blue petal water lily, Nymphia colorata. And the genome is about 409 million nucleotides in length, um, which is about three times the size of the Arabidopsis genome. And in this study, my colleagues also sequenced the transcriptomes of 19 other water lilies. So these are the protein coding genes throughout the genome. So we did a phy phylogenomic dating analysis of these data. Um, so this analysis, this data set included um, the protein coding genes of 71 genomes and 44 sorry, 44 genomes and 71 transcriptomes. But this, the dating analysis was actually only done on 101 low copy nuclear genes. <clears throat> and what we found was that uh, with 21 fossil based calibrations, we found that the age of crown angiosperms is about 250 million years. So similar to the estimates from chloroplast genomes. And uh, we find some interesting results for the uh, relationships among um, angiosperms, especially the ANA grade angiosperms. So we have Ambrella as a sister lineage to the rest of the angiosperms. The next sister lineage is Nymphialis, which is the water lilies here, plus other aquatic plants. <clears throat> and the blue dot indicates the, the um, Nymphia colorata, the, the focus of the study. And when we look at 
uh, the relationships among, among these lineages, we have these three competing trees. And when we look at 2,169 low copy nuclear genes, we find that 811 of them support this tree here, which places Ambrella as the sister lineage to the remaining angiosperms. And about 300 genes support the uh, other two resolutions, which is uh, kind of what you expect under conditions of incomplete lineage sorting. So in summary, um, phylogenomic dating now involves data sets that, that consist of hundreds of thousands of genes. So we have huge data sets, but what we've also seen is that increasing the size of the data set doesn't necessarily improve our data estimates. We've also found that it's important to choose the right models. So to choose the right clock models to capture the rate variation, rate heterogeneity in our data set. And also the importance of fossil information. So um, the fossil calibrations play a, a very important role in, in our molecular dating analyses. And it's important to find uh, new or better ways of incorporating that fossil information into our phylogenomic dating analyses. So some of the key challenges are to account for complex evolutionary history. So to, to capture the rate variation among genes and among lineages in a, in a better way and to build better models of rate variation. So the, the models that we've been using so far are descriptive models rather than mechanistic models. So they try to capture the variation, but they don't, um, they don't necessarily say what causes that variation. And we now have improving, uh, improved knowledge of what causes rate variation among lineages, which forms the foundation for building these mechanistic models. <clears throat> but I think we're still a very, very long way off from those. So the, the work in this talk was done in collaboration with a range of people. So with, um, with members of my own research group, but also with colleagues at the Botanic Gardens and also um, with international collaborators. And this work was partly funded by the Australian Research Council. All right, so that's all I've got to say and I'm happy to take any questions.